summer of 2010. It was an incredibly intense period of being at war in Afghanistan. We had so many targets to go after and so many casualties across the board. This was just one of the deadliest times to be on the battlefield. The country was a little out of control in the areas we were working in. You know, casualty rates started going up. Uh, Firefighters started getting a little longer. Uh, helicopters were being shot at or shot down. Team Arrow is a task force that was created to gather intelligence for the conventional military by entering areas that coalition forces had not been in uh, in a recent time. We were able to give good intelligence by being up front, for lack of a better word, behind enemy lines. We didn't have specific people, usually, that we were going after. Um, we would have a specific area that is a hot spot, you know, and we would target that area because we knew that there was a lot of enemy activity there. We were all, all, all over the country, so different terrain, different compounds, different people. So, like, anything can go on at any time. We were essentially just the worm on the end of a hook. But uh, it was a great way to spark things up. It's kind of every ranger's dream to go get in a fight. That's what you, that's what you signed up for. That's what I signed up for. Hey, take this corner. When you have a enemy fighter and you know about where he's at, you know about what he looks like and you know what he's shooting at you with, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a problem, but it's a problem you can deal with. But when you have these, these IEDs that are hidden in all sorts of places where they think that you're going to walk and you have no, no way to detect them sometimes, it's, that's a scary thought. The term IED simply means improvised explosive device. And that was the largest killer on our battlefield at that time as a bomb technician. You are at the tip of the spear, and that's a very dangerous place to be. You're likely gonna be the first one to run into an improvised explosive device, or if there's a tripwire, you're the one that's gonna run into that tripwire. And you're taking the hazard that everybody else wants to move away from, and you're the person that has to move very calmly and very purposefully towards that hazard. But in order for me to save the lives that, that I was able to affect, I had to also be there for the day that, you know, being on the battlefield almost claimed my own life. September 19th, 2010. We were going out for a whole night. We were gonna try to draw in the enemy to combat us all day long. So basically, we ended up walking a very rudimentary dirt road, brush and weeds and, and trees on both sides. Just to the right of that, right off the edge, you have this maybe six, seven foot deep sewage canal. And on the other side of that canal, there's a wall. And the wall's probably eight feet high. We had to get, you know, all 50 dudes across this area to get to where the possible Taliban stronghold was. Because of the combination of the steep embankment and the very high wall, it was something that we couldn't just ladder over. That's the, the normal way that we would have preferred to cross a wall like that. We found a break in the wall that we had previously identified and thought that that could be a potential crossing point. As we approached it, I said, look, if I was a bomber living anywhere around here, this is exactly where I would place a device. Brian gets over there and they do their thing. They look for trip wires, kind of check the ground to see if there's disturbed earth and see if there's pressure plates or something that was recently dug there. I'm making sure there's nothing where the water meets the embankment. Eventually, I think I got down on my hands and knees and I pulled that small handheld metal detector out of my pocket. I gently probed the earth in front of me to, you know, to look and see if I could find anything because I was so convinced that there was something there. There had to be something there. We're stopped up at the wall within the first 10 minutes, 15 minutes of the, of the objective and where everybody's taking a knee and facing out, and we're figuring out how we're going to get past this uh, obstacle. And the blast went off. The plume of smoke went up easily 60, 70 feet into the air. To be honest, uh, my first assessment was whoever was hit by that is probably not alive anymore. 
the improvised explosive device that I thought was there found me or, or I found it. You know, I still can't see anything but just like the outline of a person because it's so browned out with sand and dust. So I started patting down his arms and his legs and I get to where his knees are and it stops and that didn't click again. I didn't realize what had just happened and what I was feeling. And I did it again and I went down to his, about his knees and then I didn't feel anything else and I thought that was really weird. And uh, that's when my partner started screaming for a medic. As soon as I hear that, you know, it's just, you know, just instinct or what, like I started booking straight through towards the, the bridge point. I still didn't know who it was. I mean, I think I saw EOD, so I knew like, oh, well, that's our EOD guy, that's mass. First thing I look at, I see his legs. I'm like, that's weird. What the heck are those tree branches doing sticking out of his legs? Like, is he laying under, under like a tree branch or something? Like, what's going on here? I throw my aid back down. And I look like, oh my God, those are his femurs. I think he's had like, I can't breathe or whatnot. So that alarmed me. So I threw his body armor off. Didn't find any holes. You know, my lungs feel like they're filled with, you know, chalk or something, you know, it's making me cough and I and I'm, feel like I'm blinded. I'm having to wipe all the, all the dirt and, and all of this out of my eyes. And it was right about at that time that I really started to figure out um, that I was seriously injured. I'm, I'm looking at my left arm and my left arm, all of these fingers, they were broken and they were pointing in just really crazy directions. I put a tourniquet on one of his legs. The medics put one on his other leg and then on his arm. It's probably the most painful thing that I can remember ever happening. Uh, you know, if the end of my limb looked something like this, they were wrenching a tourniquet down on top of it to tighten it down as, as tight as they possibly could to make sure I don't hemorrhage out on the battlefield. We're lucky that, you know, the blast cauterized uh, his legs and he wasn't bleeding very much. And then they start working on other things, getting his equipment off. Um, you know, running fluids on them and, and doing their thing. And at that point, I, I stepped back. After that, they got me onto the stretcher. And this all happened in a really quick period of time. It was a very surreal experience being transported on the stretcher. We're used to seeing the world go by as we walk around the world vertically. And all of a sudden, I'm laying on the flat of my back and I'm seeing the world go by like this. You know, somebody gave me a salute and told me that I was gonna be okay. And that's the last thing that I remember from, from that night. The next memory that I have is about five days later when I woke up to this nurse asking me if I knew where I was, and uh, to which I said, I have no idea where I am. And she said, you know, your name is Brian Mast. You're in Washington, D.C. at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, and you're gonna be in surgery in a couple hours. I didn't even know at that point really what my injuries were. I didn't know that I had just, you know, had both of my legs amputated somewhere above my knees um, or that I had a missing index finger or damage to my forearm. I really didn't know what the injuries were. It wasn't until after this incident that I really got to, you know, see him, see his personality, kind of see how he handles with tragedy, how he handles this, you know, this, this horrible thing that's happened to him. Being able to, you know, walk and regain his normal functioning is just, you know, it's quite the testament of, you know, his strength and his drive. It's awesome to see a guy like that have so much determination and he's an inspiration to other veterans who have gone through, you know, situations like his. The thing that I'm most proud of, it's not any, any medal or award, it's when the Rangers gave me a ceremony to make me an honorary member of uh, the 75th Ranger Regiment. That day, they said, you're officially a, um, a Ranger, you're officially one of us. He is a Ranger in my book. There's no question about that. And a lot of guys are just as hard as him and, and just as uh, determined as him. That was part of what makes me so proud about these guys that I work with, is they are the tip of the spear, going out every single night knowing the hazards that they were going to have to combat. Taking contact and losing guys, it's just kind of, it's hard to put into words that kind of experience. 
just very thankful that you get home alive in one piece. Americans have always been willing to pay that price. And those rangers that I work with, they, they embody that every single night.